Recording is in progress. If anyone doesn't want to be recorded, uh, unfortunately I have to record the thing, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, here's my side shot. Oh, uh, good morning to you all. My name is Minamoto no Hideaki, and this is my class. Welcome. This class touches upon two sets of entwined issues. The first set of issues is how do you find primary and secondary sources for research into historical Chinese clothing? How to evaluate the accuracy and appropriateness of these sources and how to use them appropriately. The second set of issues centers on a very, very modern, very, very post 1600 CE problem, which is the pervasive and corrupting influence of the contemporary Han Fu Yun Dong, which by the way, literally translates into the Han clothing movement. And the, this pervasive and corrupting influence have on um, information available to a monolingual English Scadian who wants to research and make historical Chinese clothing for SE events. In order to explain this second set of issues, I'm going to go into post-1600 and essentially modern Chinese history because I need to talk to you about the historical and cultural context the Han clothing movement started from and evolved in. And the point here is that I want you to understand why legitimizing Han clothing, that is Han Fu, as historical costuming is deeply problematic, especially within the Western and specifically this Anglophone costuming world that we operate in. For those of you who haven't met me before, hi, my name is Minamoto no Hideaki. Um, I am Culturally and ethnically, I identify as Han, which is the ethnic group that makes up around 92% of the total PRC population, and also a substantial portion of the Chinese diaspora worldwide. Um, I myself am fluent in Mandarin. I have a reasonably solid understanding of liter literary Chinese, and I spent a decade of my life living in the People's Republic of China. In other words, I probably have a better understanding of mainland Chinese society and culture than most people here today. This, by the way, is not a boast on my part. This is a statement of fact that too often plays out in DSEA for good oil. Uh, for the record, I would also like to state that we people of color, you know, and me, a Chinese person, are not infallible. So please don't take my words as the absolute and unadulterated truth. You are more than welcome to have any of my Mandarin sources independently translated to see for yourself. A note about my name. Um, I started in the SCA with a very strong interest in Heian era Japan, which is why my name is, my SCA name is my SCA name. However, in recent years, or rather for the last mm -hmm. five years, I have gravitated towards pre-1600 China uh, with two main areas of interest, which is the second century before coming over Maondu one clothing and textiles, and the 40-year period between 680 and 720 Common Era, the Tang Dynasty. However, I'm only really going to be talking about the second century before common era Maondu wine clothing today, because if you want me to talk about town clothing, we're going to be here until midnight, my time. So, here are some Google image results for ancient Chinese clothing. And unfortunately, all of them, except for this, that one, that one mm -hmm. is, has very little root 
to in reality. Some of these might have some of these might have geez, some of these might have uh, some of these sorry. Some of you might think that these are acceptable attempts at pre-1600 Chinese clothing for SE purposes. I beg to differ. I don't think they are. The first, first off, right? If someone is not bothered to acquire enough working knowledge to distinguish the fantastical and concocted from actual historical costumes and garments of the culture they have chosen to portray within the SCA, they have no business deciding what is an attempt and what isn't. Secondly, all of this, all of this uh, derivations of film and TV costumes somewhere between the Tudors and the Vikings in Calibre. In other words, they're not, they're not very good. They're not very, the, the starting point is pretty not great. And this, this only makes things worse. Here, I'm just gonna move this bar down here. So here we have a timeline of Chinese hist history that I have um, originally made by someone on Wikipedia. So with historical costuming, you are all, you know, one is often told to pick a century, pick a decade to get started. Historical Chinese costumes and fashion are not exempt from this fairly standard practice. However, as many dynasties lasted more than a century, picking a dynasty and then an era from that dynasty would be a more appropriate approach. Here I've noted what dynasties have excellent garments you'll see that some of them don't have any and some of them have a lot. Uh, it's also worth noting that where there is an absence of excellent garments, there is often is a wealth of figural art that depict people wearing clothes, things like tomb frescoes, funerary figurines, uh, donor portraits, uh, woodblock, woodblock etchings, depictions of people in, in contemporary clothing, um, vases, bowls, and so on and so forth. Note also here that there's a time span from around 4th century before common era to the late 1500s common era between the oldest and the youngest, relatively speaking, extant garments, Chinese extant garments, for SEA considerations. In other words, around two millennia. It's a lot. Two millennia's worth of clothes is a lot of clothes. Um, and given this abundance of information, per this meme, ancient Chinese clothing is therefore not very useful as a search query on English language search engines like Google. Uh, never mind that ancient, quote unquote, is a bit absurd when you blanket apply it to two millennia's worth of clothing. It's like as if said as it's it's as if someone referring to everything from the Roman Empire to the middle of Renaissance Florence or Florence or Venice as ancient Italia. Like that does not work. That just doesn't work. So here, instead of saying ancient Chinese clothing, being quite unclear about, you know, how, first of all, how ancient is ancient. Second of all, you got a lot to pick from. You have to be more specific about that. X dynasty clothing is probably more likely to get our researchers started in the right direction. Having said this, so how do you make sure that whatever whatever information you get is reliable and accurate and relevant to what you want, right? So I tend to use a mixture of scholarly publications, digitized museum collections, excavation reports, 
and more scholarly publications and um, modern, again, scholarly publications, sometimes also exhibition catalogs as well for research. In other words, I put all these sources through the CRAAP, a CRAAP test. CRAAP test stands for currency. You know, when was this information published? Relevance. You know, how relevant is this information to my needs? Authority. Who published this information? You know, what is it some random on the internet or is it by the people who, as in the case of the Changsha Ma Wang Dui Yihao Hebel, the number one Han Tun Ma Wang Dui at Changsha, you know, it, this excavation report was published by the people who, who not only dug it up but also conserved it. People attached, the archaeologists and people attached to the museum of Hunan here, this museum, that um, to this day that has hosted the Maundu one hand tomb artifacts from time of excavation to this day. Anyways, you know, is, is, is it something to this caliber? Or is it some random on the internet? Accuracy, how truthful and correct is that information? And purpose, so for what reason does this information exist? Does it exist to convince me to, of some cultural, political agenda? Or does it exist to tell me, inform me factually of, we found this tomb, we found these things, here are the measurements, you know? And all of these resources that I've used have passed the CRAAP, crap test. Take this one for example. This is the excavation report of Ma Wang Dui Wan, an uh, early Western Han tomb outside of uh, founding Central Western China. The tomb itself was excavated in 1972. This book was published in 1973, so a year after it was, they, they found it. Very, very like as close to me being at the dig as possible, highly relevant to my research interest, that is Malandui, the Malandui hand tomb, uh, textiles and clothing. Very well, it's published by the, this, the joint published by this museum and the China Academy of Social Sciences. And it's the publishing house is the Cultural Relic Publishing House, AKA the publishing house of basically every archaeological excavation report and archae academic archaeological publication in China. A pretty, we're pretty good on the authority front there. In terms of accuracy, again, this is the exhibition report. It's as close as I can get to being at the actual dig, despite not having, despite not even existing at the time of that dig. And it is very suited to my purpose because this, to this, Marvelous two books contains not only um, measurements, but also scaled line drawings and detailed descriptions of the stuff that's in the uh, detailed descriptions of everything they dug up. In fact, the volume, so this is in two, volume two is literally end to end photographic plates of the finds that they have. Similarly, this book, which is the studies of textiles on earth excavated from the Maundui Wan Han tomb at, Chang at Changsha, this one is was published in 1980, and it's published by the Cultural Relic Publishing House, or Cultural Relic Press. It's very relevant to my needs. It's the the people who wrote it are a mixture of textile engineers, conservationists, archaeologists, textile archaeologists, what have you. This book, in fact, contains weaving drafts for some of the fabrics found in Malon de Wan. In other words, if I had the capital to do so, I can take some of these weaving drafts to a weaver 
uh, that is uh, either a, a weaver, a hand weaver or a machine or a um, modern textile mill and ask them, I would like to give you money if you can, uh, money and a lot of it, if you can weave this fabric for me. And some, and chances are they're going to look at it and say, okay, we need to make some modifications, but we can do this. This is how accurate this book is. It's, 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 some of it is literally a, this is how you do it, instruction for recreating some of the, the looks, but not in, not in the modern um, patterns of fashion or the Tudor tailor way. And for purpose, very, very relevant to my purpose. Same with this one, same with this one, same with the Ma Wandui, same with the Hunan Museum collection database. Right, to some of you, my standards for sources may seem like overkill. And sometimes I do ask myself, why am I even doing this? Why can't I just grab random information off the internet and be done with and call it a day? Well, to me, you see, there's a question of due diligence and cultural duty. I owe it to myself to present historical Chinese clothing as accurately as I can to a appreciative and um, for an appreciative and curious audience, because let's be honest, there is an excess of nonsense out there. However, researching China, historical Chinese clothing does have a lot of barriers. One of which is one of which is linguistic. I am only able to do this because I am fluent in Mandarin. If I was not fluent in Mandarin, I would not be able to understand this, this, and this, and this, because um, a lot of these publications do not have an English counterpart. This one and this one, they have English abstracts, but they're so short and so like de deprived of technical information that there's not much substance to them. Um, that's just the case for a lot of the older publications. This one's a newer publication, still doesn't have much in the way of English. Museum sites often has an English and a Mandarin version, the pages, but sometimes, no, not sometimes, a lot of the times, the useful information is only on the Chinese page. Access to this information can also be difficult because they're generally only available, so this sort of books is only really available from university and state libraries. Um, some of the papers I've used for my Mount one project are only available from research databases that university subscribe to. In fact, the only way for me to have obtained some of this was when I was at uni and when I had access to my university's research databases. and. I was able to get them that way. But if I was just doing this on my own now, having, you know, not having the access to those research databases, I wouldn't be able to get these papers. So there's that. Um, another one is cost. These, I have all three of these books. They cost me a lot of money to buy. And this one, and this one specifically, I could only get because at the time of purchase, I had a friend in China who was very, very willing and happy to buy them for me and mail them to me. Uh, shopping across the Great Firewall is a bit of a, it's, it's a bit of a fiddle at times. Anyways, as it stands, I'm not aware of there being any publication on the topic of historical Chinese clothing that is of the same caliber as our beloved fa patterns of fashion and the Tudor Taylor series in terms of both hands-on and hands-on practicality and academic rigor. Look, if they exist, believe me, I'd be teaching a lot more classes and I'd be doing a lot more costuming and I'd be entering into a lot more competitions. Anyways, so I've talked about my Mao Day one project, but I haven't told you where it is. Here's for when and where. And that's that's where it is in relation to modern People's Republic of China. Yeah, so 
it's it's a series of three tombs. The first one was it's well, only one because it was discovered first. It was 1972. Yes, in the middle of the Cultural Revolution, and they found it when they were digging the foundations for a hospital in what in a semi-rural area outside of Changsha, which is in Hunan province. Um, the archaeologists and scientists that were then in exile and re-education re were actually called back to the site for the excavation and the subsequent conservation of the tomb finds and the, and the publication of these tomb finds. So Mount Dui 1 is actually a group of three tombs. Mount Dui 2 is the tomb 1's husband. Mount Dui 3 is a tomb, tomb 1 and tomb 1's son. Her name, the lady buried in Mount Dui 1, her name is Sindri, and she was a Marquis. Here I've included, then this is her seal from the museum. Uh, she is very, very well preserved, but I'm not going to show you a picture of that because, hey, she's, you know, respect to the dead and whatnot. I've included her body measurements because this is relevant to the clothing, to the clothing she is to the clothing she was buried with, because a lot of them are what she would have worn in life. And I'm actually of a similar dimensions to her. So yeah, quite handy for quite handy for me because I, I do want to make one-to-one -one recreations and being this being kind of the same size is handy for that. Alright. I'm just gonna have a look at the chat, so I'll stop, I'll pause share. And I'll have a look at the chat. Yes, 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 I agree with you, Wobi. I would like one of those looms too, but I don't have the space for it. <clears throat> so, um, this is one of the 12 rows she was buried with. This colored photograph of it comes from the Huna Museum. But in the 1973 excavation report, remember those two books with the blue cover? Yeah, those contains more detailed information about the fabrics and materials used. Um, just looking at this, you can't really see how it's constructed, right? But you can see that this is a pattern fabric. And again, you can't really tell from this at this resolution, but this is actually a, fa uh, a um, pattern fabric as well. So the following information, comes from the 1973 excavation report. The upper fabric is a patterned complex gauze. In other words, this is a gauze with a pattern woven into it. It's also embroidered in an all over abstract design in chain stitch in three different colors. This darker fabric is what is termed by Decker, is what's termed as a Lupa brocade, which is similar to like a patterned velvet, but not quite. It's the interlining of this robe is silk floss batting, which suggests that this robe was probably made for cooler weather and it's lined in plain silk. It is estimated that for the upper and lining, about 32 meters of 50 centimeter wide silk fabric went into the make, went into this robe. Uh, now, the Marquis, you know, at a, a maximum height of around 160 centimeters, she would have had an arm span of around 160 centimeters. Look at that arm span. Look at that length. This is a floor trailing garment with approximately like half a meter of sleeve on each, half a meter of sleeve that goes past your fingertips. That goes that would have gone past the fingertips at each end. This is a robe. This is a fantastically luxurious outer robe, unsuited to anything but a largely sedentary lifestyle with little to no physical exertions. Uh, in other words, this is not a suitable attire for multi-day camping event. This is for ANS displays and maybe a laurels ceremony. Um, the, the exploration report also called this a curved front robe because the front overlap is relatively curved as compared to the straight front robe, which I'll show you later on. 
So here's an example of the complex scores from Aldo one, you know, similar to what the top of this robe is made from. As you can see here, it is a see-through fabric. This particular fabric calculated from this measurement has a grams per square meter of 43.4, uh, roughly it's like a lighter habite sort of weight. To the best of my knowledge, this fabric is not commercially available as a reproduction, which is good because if it was commercially available to weave this sort of fabric, it costs a lot of money. And here are the line drawings I was talking about. So from the from the main from the main uh, the the color photograph, you couldn't really see the construction details, right? You can't like you can't see where the seams are on this. You can see some fold marks, and that okay, this is obviously a different fabric to this, but you can't really tell much more beyond that. Here we have the line drawings from three to nine of this robe from the excavation report that shows us that this robe is in two parts and it's, 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 it's extensively pieced. Um, this is like, this is the information that you can't get just by looking at this one picture. You need to go to a source that actually shows you the line drawings of the, the robe. You can't just rely on photographs. It's, as you can see, it's extensively pieced. It's made in two parts, the upper and the lower. Um, the length of the upper is around, I think, 40, 50, 60 centimeters long, which would put the upper at around the Marquise's hips and not her waist. Um, both of these, as you can see here, are extensively pieced. and which is characteristic of garments made during a time when fabric was both valuable and limited in their width by how far the weaver could comfortably stretch their arms at the loom. So here we have, so the, the grain direction arrows were added by a scholar called Zhang Ling for, the paper, for her 2016 paper on the tech, um, techniques of cutting a hand in a sea woman's coat front robe using the Malandre robe as an example. And he having, and, but this is on the basis of, but these drawings in and of themselves are from the 1973 uh, excavation report. As we can see here, the upper is pieced from five, um, the five bolt width. So one, two and a half for each side of the body. The lowest piece from four, but it's on a weird angle. The cuffs are made of a single strip of loupard brocade, half a bolt width is around 25 centimeters. So a bolt width is about 50 centimeters, a half bolt width is around 25 centimeters. And it's sewn into a tube on the bias. It's very strange. It's a very, very strange thing to do. The collar, hem, and overlap trim. So collar, hem, overlap trim. This this bit. That's pieced on the bias. So sorry, that's pieced from sections of twenty five centimeter wide blue pop okay, cut on the bias, the true bias, and the lining of it is just plain even weave silk. Okay, so the collar. And the cuffs and the hem trim that the brocade they use there is a heavier fabric than embroidered complex or the upper fabric. And there are three main reasons why the seamstress might have chosen to use, and by extension, the, the Marquise who commissioned who had these made for her, might have used them. This the the brocade is harder wearing than the gauze, so putting them in areas of high wear like collar, hem, this would have been trailing on the floor collar hem cuffs, that makes sense, prolong the life of the, the garment. Uh, it's conspicuous consumption turned up to 11 because this is embroidered, this is expensive enough. 
And then we, we, we're just going to use brocade because it's actually more hard wearing than the embroidered gauze. Yeah, that's just conspicuous consumption, 10 up to 11. This woman was running out of ways to show everyone how rich she was. And it's also, I guess you could also say it helps with the drape of the robe because the upper and the lining are both relatively light sort of fabric, but the, the brocade is heavier. Speaking of the brocade, here's an example. This is what it looks like. Um, I don't think it's the exact brocade, but this is a good idea. So the patterns are made up by uncut loops on a, I think, an even weave background. And here is a Beckham Wagner's magnified creation of this type of brocade. You can see that the, the loops makes the pattern and this will, you know, gives a visual interest as well. This would be a really, really luxurious, rich looking garment when it was brand, when it was not buried in the ground. Um, this is a embroidery motif for three to nine ten. Again, this is a line drawing from the 1973 report that Zhang Ling used in her paper. So I've, this is reproduced from Zhang Ling's 2016 paper. The three colors from top to bottom here, maroon, yellow, vermilion. Vermilion as in vermilion red. And this pattern is embroidered all over the surface, the upper fabric of robe uh, three, nine, three to nine ten. So, see that? That is this. Also, just before we go any further, people, can you hear me? Am I clear enough? Yes. Yeah, you're fine. Excellent. Good. I shall continue. Uh, so, but, you know, just looking at the archaeological report, just looking at the photographs, it doesn't really give us an idea of what it, what this robe looks on, on a clothes, on a person, right? It doesn't give us a 3D idea of what it, what it looks like when it's worn. And it doesn't give us... So for that, we want to go to something that reflects what a person in early Western Han in the kingdom of Changsha would have thought someone in this sort of robe would look like. That's so we go to this. This is a standing, this is a figuring from Ondu One, which depicts a woman in, in what is probably a robe similar to 3, 2, 9, 10. Now, 3D representations of the clothed body is very are very important to my research because they represent, you know, especially ones from in period, because they represent the in period idea of what the entire costume looks like when worn. You know, obviously, Researching my capacity for researching this environment in this area is limited by, you know, what I can, what photos I can find of the sculpture, but also by the medium of the sculpture and the, the style and conventions of the artists operated on that at the time. Like, you know, this is so this, this, this sculpture, by the way, is available in basically 360 view on the Hunan Museum collection database, data, database page. Um, and it shows a person probably wearing probably a curved front robe. But, you know, in, from in the eye of a Western, early Western Han artist. But what it, there are still limitations, right? Whilst it does show a quite a nice hairstyle and you know the general shape and drape of the garment, it doesn't really give you a, a you know a useful idea of textures or seam placements or drape. So for these things, we have to go to other sources, which I'll show later. But before we do that, I'm going to show you what I've done using this using the 1933 uh, research 
1933 excavation manual and all of my other of my other resources. So this is a one to five scale, roughly reproduction uh, recreation of the curved front robe for my uh, IKEA artist mannequin because. I was I had never made one of these before and I didn't want to do it full scale because that would be really expensive, especially if I'm doing if I'm doing it with silk and very and pretty difficult. So here I've used a heavy rayon tabby in, in even weave tabby, even weave rayon in place of the pile loop brocade because I you know it's not available to purchase. And I've used a some chiffon recycled from an old top for my uh, for for the upper of this robe because again complex scores is not available for purchase um, this is to imitate the the weight difference between the tab between the the loop pile brocade and the complex scores the robe itself is not lined or interlined like the original, so that's different. I didn't do the thing song, on a strip of fabric on the straight song to a bias tube for this because it would, for the cuffs, because that would have been really, really fiddly at this scale. I also didn't piece the collars as they were pieced in the original. Again, I was short on time and the, it would have been fiddly as hell. Here I've just put this on, on over a mock-up of the same robe in green cotton, which is why you see the, that green tinge, which, you know, have it doesn't, the fact it doesn't have a lining or interlining, it makes it drape a bit more, probably a bit more than the original. This is obvious, even at this size, even at this scale, it's a, this robe 32910 is an imposing and voluminous garment. It is not something that will work for an SEA event where you are going to be active. So this is more of more of the reproductions. I'm pretty proud of this. Okay, I'm just gonna have a look at the chat. Uh there is I'll see about the handout because the slideshow alone doesn't provide enough in, enough useful information. So, so the answer to that is maybe. But this class is also being recorded. Hello? So anyway, so I've talked, so I, this is a straight front row I wanted to talk about. Of the 12 excellent rows, there are only three of these, probably demonstrating uh, the Marquise's preference for the more luxurious curve front rope because this actually uses less fabric than the straight front than the curve front. It's still pretty big though. Um, as you can see from the cut of this, it's much simpler than the curve front. The skirt is only has three sections, basically squares. The sleeves instead of two and a half bolt width per sleeve, it's two bolt width per sleeve. Um, the trims are also much piecing, much larger, uh, and therefore more conservative or fabric sizing. So there's, you know, it, it's a comparatively more modest garment, but this robe, 32912, is anything but modest because you see the design, you see this? Okay, looking at the photo, it doesn't tell, you can't really tell what it is. It looks like, it looks like a, you know, printed design or mold. This looks a bit like mold, for example. But the excavation manual tells us, the excavation report and also the analysis, the studies of textiles from Mount One tells us that this is actually a combination, that the pattern you're seeing is actually a combination of printing and hand, and hand painting. So this is this is the level that we're operating at. This is this is how 
200 repeats per meter. Yeah, it's, it's a luxury garment. And this information I obtained because I looked at the pic because I have the excavation, the, the textile studies and the excavation manual, the excavation report on hand. Again, demonstrating the importance of looking at not only sticking to the the image, but also looking at line drawings. Because if I, oops, you know, you can't tell how this is constructed. You can sort of see the same line there, unless you look at this, right? Same as the three to nine, ten probe. Again, this is some. Recreation scale recreations I made of the Mount Day wine robes of three to nine twelve. This time I'm using a um, this was cotton and linen. I didn't I did I I hadn't I didn't have a lot of silk at the time when I made this. You can see even at the size, you know, five to one and not particularly detailed, not particularly mathematically accurate. I try my best, but um, because but you know this this I can only cut to you know point one one place after the decimal point. It's still a really nice garment. It's you know this is something you would probably wear to an SE event as opposed to the curved front, which is baggy and imposing. This is still imposing, but it's slightly less imposing, slightly more practical. And notice that I've tied the belt at the waist. No, at the hips and not the waist. And um, this is where I'm going to go. And this was informed by me looking at contemporary artworks. Contemporary, that is, contemporary to the Marquis of Dai. In other words, early Western Han artworks. So. Excellent garments aside, contemporary artworks can also provide us with information on costumes, hairstyles, and footwear. So we're, here we have two figures, both of them from the Hanyang Mausoleum, uh, burial pits from modern day Shenxi. And these two are significantly closer to the imperial capital Chang'an than the kingdom of Changsha. And their clothing and hairstyles and footwear probably reflected more of the palace and capital fashion at the time rather than the regional fashions at the time as exemplified by the finds of Malandu one. These two sculptures are effigies of servants, so probably but probably higher rank servants, like ladies in waiting, judging by their colourful and voluminous attires. Here we see that they're layering one, two, three, and this one is one, two, three, four. So three to four robes, the uppermost one the uppermost one is sorry, the uppermost one is a narrow collar robe, but the other ones are wide collar robes. Um, oh, and by the way, you see her shoes. Mandu one had these exact shoes, these little cat ear shoes, slippers. They're actually slippers. They're, they're great. They're really cute. So. Um, the, but the overall shape and profile are still quite similar to the Maundi one figuring we saw earlier, uh, except for these have a, this gives you a better idea of drape and texture. The, the, this lady here on the left also shows us where the belt is on the body. Hips, not the waist, hips. This is, and I was informed by this sculpture in particular to put the belt on my mannequin at the mannequin's hips and not the waist. Was a boat printed and hand painted? Good question. I would have printed for the sake of from a modern textiles production perspective, I would have I would have painted hand printed and then hand painted the entire boat rather than the garment because printing a garment is kind of fiddly. Anyways, here we have another sculpture from the Hanya Mausoleum burial pit. It, it shows a dancer. And as we all know, dancing requires freedom of movement. And here the dancer's robe is shown to be much shorter than her sister's in the first two pages. 
and oh my god, she's wearing pants. Uh, very wide, very loose, very wide leather trousers under her robe. Um, and her robes are actually quite tightly wrapped around around her, not only for ease of movement, but also to show off her willowy figure. The demonstrant, but she's still wearing the same slippers, the cat head slippers, that cute. Here we have a lower, again, she is also from the Haiyan Mausoleum, but here we see the difference in status. This is a lower ranking servant. She's actually a sweeper. And when this was made, when it was newly made, she not only would she have been painted, she would also have held a miniature room in her hands that is now brought away because that would have been made from, you know, twigs and straw. This is a lower ranked servant. Her robes are clear off the ground. She's wearing very sensible square toed shoes. She's wearing pants under her robes. Um, her sleeves are much less baggy than the ones we see here. Right? Much, much less baggy. She's wearing fewer, she's still wearing, I think, three, three layers. And yeah, she's wearing pants. And you can see the pants. So, you know, this is this is an outfit I would make for an SCA event. This is an outfit I would make for a camping, a multi-day camping event. It is practical, it is warm, it is something I can move in, and I don't have to worry about getting things dirty. Here we have, so on the left here, we have another dancer from the Haya Mausoleum, this time to sleeps. And she's got a longer robe than the friend than the friend we just saw. And you can, and you see this fanning? It's actually quite similar to how, how this one sort of fans up, or how this one sort of fans up. You can see the, the fanning at the, at the hips, at the, at the hem. And this uh, example from the Studio Museum also, you know, also shows that that wearing that she's wearing trousers on her robes, and you can just about see where over where this robe wraps around her, and it's much lower than the natural waist, which is like probably about here. Okay. Show of hands. Who wants to watch this? Hand raised because I don't know where to put it. Yeah, sure. First, if we have time. We're watching this. Yeah, sorry, this is just Australia. I'm just going to fast forward. It's six minutes. We're just going to sit through this. Yeah, right. Ceremonial purposes. Guys, did you hear to hear that? Ceremonial purposes. My one day one clothing, by the way, is day wear. Luxury day wear, still day wear. Mm hmm Okay. All right. I quote, almost impossible at this point to replicate it. Yeah, right. Or the cut from. Oh, 
Well, that's not wrong. I mean, we did see the packs and you have multiple layers. It's not just one. I can't recommend this. It makes going to the bathroom much easier. Okay, just 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 the the middle scene thing, right? It it does actually have that meaning, but you know why else there is a middle scene down the back? It's because the fabric isn't wide enough, so you have to piece it down the middle. It's it's literally just a practical thing that was given meaning later on in history. It's all given meaning by people who. You know, the people who write the books typically aren't the ones selling, so. Mm hmm Mm-hmm. Okay, you see this, guys, you see this? I'm just gonna go back to my slideshow. Um, can you guys see my slideshow at the moment? Yes. Excellent. I'm going all the way back to my... So, the Shuju, she's talking about the curved front, the, hem, the curved hem, is... This is the robe she's talking about. You see how this is not, like, one whole freaking piece of fabric extending out? It's actually pieced. And it's, like, the edging is much, much wider here than in, ostensibly, the Shuju she uses... I quote unquote recreate. You know, the thing that she says, oh, it's so hard to recreate. What is this? What is this? What do you call this? <laughs> hard to recreate my foot. Okay, maybe maybe not down to the materials because that's, that's gonna cost you a lot of money. But yeah. I can't do that video. Anyways, back to the video. Uh-huh. Yeah, right.
Okay, we're gonna stop here. I've had enough. Okay, yes, okay. Before we go, just just look at this. Just look at this. Yeah. Back to my slides. Okay. So with this, where do I start? The curve from rope that we I'll be honest with you, I don't even know where to start with this concocted nonsense. I I I genuinely do not know where to start. The curved front robe or the curved hand robe, as we've seen in my previous ex examinations of the curved front robe, robe 3, 2, 9, 10 from the Malandri 1 time 2, Western hand 2, is a floor length and trailing garment. It is not this knee length and skirt combination. It's not. It's a stable. Malandri 1 did have skirts, but they would not have been showing when the Marquis had them on. Um, it's not a hand in a wrap dress. It is not a wrap dress. It is a robe. The belt position, right? She's doing it at her waist. We know from excellent garments that it is down at the hips. And the hip style, I mean, look at her hair. Look at their hair. Look at her hair. Look at her hair. Look at their hair. It's pretty damn far removed from what is depicted in Han, Western, early Western Han Dynasty art. This, ladies, gentlemen, this beloved audience is not the way to do things. Yeah, yeah, it'd be more like that if this the under the undergarment was pants. Okay, so this I think came from the the curve front. So that weird skirt top and front top and skirt combo, I think, and the hairstyle, I think, comes from actually film and TV costuming because this is a still from the film the fan historical fantasy film painted skin it it's historical fantasy because it has among other things a shape-shifting fox spirit in it and here we have a still from the tv series beauty's rival in Paris, which is in which is from 2010 um this is about the life and trials of the Emperor Stowe, who is actually a near contempt a contemporary of the Marquise of Dyer, whose clothes we just spent, you know, half an hour looking at. It's pretty obvious, just looking at this, that whatever they have going on, and whatever this lady and whatever this lady has going on, is pretty far removed from historical reality. Pretty damn far removed. And, you know, by extension, archaeological evidence. Anyways, back to this. So whoever did this clearly knew of... Um, clearly knew of robe, robe, robes through to 9, 10. But like everyone else, they've assumed that the rope, the belt, is at the waist and not the hips. It's at the hips, guys. It's at the hips. And this is an example of that hand dynasty wrap dress that they were trying to do. They've also given the Marquise earrings and the necklace, despite the fact that the Marquise did not have pierced ears. We know this because the body is mummified and preserved and no necklace was found in her intact burial. This illustration and this illustration both demonstrate what I currently describe as a total absence of research. They're factually wrong and they should not be regarded as useful information. And guys, this is the nonsense. I have to do it. All right, I'm going to have a break. I'm going to stop recording uh, because I need to use the bathroom and have something to have a bit of water to drink. It's very hot today. I'll see you guys in three minutes, if that's all right. Sounds fine to me. Okay. Yeah, you can pause the recording and.
if you wanted to continue later. Yeah, she's the one who was recording. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm gonna say. No screen. Back to is it a real life? Okay. All right. Here we go. Right. So, part two of my talk. What is harmful? How did it start? And why you should be very worried of it being a thing. In a recent interaction, I, you know, in a rec recently last year, early last year, interaction with two quote unquote handful experts, they define handful for me as traditional clothing worn by the Han ethnic culture people. So more or less the same, uh, the same definition here. But per the features presented by by New Hampshire, the website I've used here, and you know you guys read through this, the Hanfu is essentially a bathrobe worn left lap all over right and with very wide sleeves, and you see things like. Tang Dynasty Hanfu and Song Dynasty Hanfu and Ming Dynasty Hanfu. So why is that? You know, why is that? Where does Hanfu even come from? To answer these questions, I must first introduce you to two things. One is that the Yellow Emperor, mentioned previously here, is a mythical figure who predated the Xia Dynasty, if the Xia Dynasty exists. And from that point on to the middle of the 17th century is around 3,644 years. As a frame of reference, Tutankhamun died in 1322 before Common Era, which to this year makes it 3,346 years. So the new Han, the, so, hold on. This claim, beloved audience, is trying to tell us that for a period longer than Tutankhamun has been dead, and by the way, not counting the time between, not counting the time between here and now, they're telling me that for this long, that my people, the Han people, which is by the way, named after this dynasty, had the one thing to wear. And that one thing bears more than a striking resemblance to a large bathrobe. And to, you know, as part of this claim, note, to the middle of the 17th century, they've locked up this part of Chinese history. The last dynasty of Imperial China. There's a term for this, friends, and that term is, as I've all very diplomatic put it, concocted nonsense. That was how you feel, really. The second thing that New Hanfu seems to not understand, that they claim, is that it's simultaneously traditional costume that span some 3,644 3, years or 45 years it's old it's very old but it's also ethnic clothing it's ethnic clothing it's the clothing of the traditional clothing worn by the Han ethnic culture people per the two handful experts I interacted with in that it represents so it represents a people as well but you see Tang Dynasty Hanfu and Han Dynasty Hanfu and Ming Dynasty Hanfu and Song Dynasty Hanfu, which also which refer to Hanfu based on the clothes of a particular period in time. Uh, 
uh, tenderness you have for by the way refers to the to the to the clothing of the near 300 years long Tang Dynasty. It's a long time. 300 years is a long time for fashion. Fashion changes a lot in 300 years. And I must bring you to this. These things, these words, these adjectives, they're not equivalent. They occasionally overlap, but they are not interchangeable terms. You can't switch one out for the other and expect it to be the same. They're not. Traditional and ethnic clothing often preserve some elements of historical costumes as they're passed down from generation to generation, but they're not historical clothing in that they don't preserve an entire outfit head to toe and from the skin out from a particular point in time. They're still worn by living people, so as time goes on, they will adapt new technologies and have simplifications and undergo changes in aesthetics and construction. So traditional clothing actually changes. Ethnic clothing actually changes. Historical clothing is from one point in time. It doesn't change. So whatever the new handful people are talking about and whatever the two handful experts, quote unquote, are talking about, they're wrong. Anyways. Let's look at an example of traditional clothing from China. Here is a prime example of traditional Chinese clothing. Some of you might have seen it. It's called the Qinghua. Uh, it's not only it's for the greater China region as well. Um, nowadays, it's most well known as a two-piece feminine wedding outfit. It's mostly strongly associated with Hong Kong, but generally speaking with Guangdong province as well, and also the greater China region. You know, I'll this over here so you guys can read it. And this is the most common version that we see today. See, you have a fitted top and a tube skirt with a panel down the front. That's often uh, both top and bo both top and skirt are made in a red fabric, embellished with metalwork embroidery, and of course, the density of embroidery, the greater the cost. And the embroideries depict dragons, phoenixes, peonies, lotuses, and so on. But this outfit it wasn't always all red, and it wasn't always called the Qinghua. And by the way, here are the categories of uh, Qinghua. By the, the density of the embroideries, this is the more expensive, second most expensive, third most expensive, and so on. So, in Chumei Hulis, 2017 article about the Qinghua, the history of the Qinghua. She traced it to the melding of 18th century Manchurian women's zifu, which is, zifu means formal clothing for festive slash celebratory occasions, and the regulations and ornament format of that Manchurian zifu with the hand woman's two piece top and skirt outfit. Manchu women were one piece robes rather than top and skirt. The most formal zifu, like this Empress or Empress Dowager's circle shown here, is a very dark blue, and the, it's almost black, with eight rondelles of polychrome ornamentations. One, two, three, four, five, and then six, seven, eight at the back, same position as in front. For an Empress or Empress Dowager's, these eight rondelles contain dragons, and this format, by the way, is called batuan, in other words, eight rondelles. So one in the front, one in the back, two at the hands from the back, one on each shoulder. The wave pattern is called li shui, standing water. And alongside the eight rondelles is also an ornament format slash component that denotes formality. Though for less informed, for less formal, though still festive occasions, such as milestone birthdays, uh, this one is for a less formal occasion. The rondelles can also have other motifs like butterflies, and flowers. In this case, we have um, the flowers of four seasons embroidered on the on this robe. We have sacred sacred bamboo, plum blossoms, and daffodils for winter, and we have also have lotus flowers for summer. Here, well, the motifs in this particular example are no longer within the roundels. Uh, instead, they're displayed as cut flowers in a vase or basket. They are, you can still recognize the eight rondel format, 
and it's still adhered to. So you have one group motif here, one group motif here, one group here, and then two on the two at the hand here. So you've got the standing water, just like this one. And this one, anyways, and between 1768 and 1841, fashion obviously changed. Anyways, the eight rondo format on a dark background was also, as I've said before, taken up by hand women for their own formal outfits. However, like their mentor sisters, they had choice in the background color and the motif in the rondo. So this woman's eight rondo jacket from the Museum of Ethnic Costumes, Beijing Institute of Fashion Technology, aka BIFT, has rondo that shows Mount Pongle and immortals, and de deer, crane, and I think, and butterflies, which by the way is, um, is a symbol of, oh, and I think, I thought it was bats, um, butterflies, which are, which is a visual poem for 80. So this jacket is probably made for an older woman to celebrate her 80th birthday. Um, deer and crane also symbols of longevity. Again, adding to the impression that this is made for an elderly lady celebrating a big milestone birthday. However, because fashion continues to evolve, emperor or not, so this is actually from the early, um, the early republic, the early days of the Republic of China era. Fashion or not, emperor or not, the size of the run does change. So these have gone a lot smaller. This is actually contemporary. Here, the combination of wheat and crane means suggest long, uh, long life, but also happy new year. So again, festive inform, you know, formal clothing. The cut of the actual top also changed, as you see in, the, in this example. And this sleeve shape, this big sleeve opening is very, very characteristic of the 20s. And sometimes the rondo was done way altogether. The jacket on the left here is from the 1910s when the single center flowers motif was popular and the slim, and the slim shape was also popular. This example from the VNA is from the 30s. Um, and the dragon phoenix motif is has prevailed to this day. This is done in colored silk. This is all padded metalwork embroidery. And these not only serve as a woman's wedding dress, but also her most formal clothing after marriage. And you can see in previous examples, this one, for example, and this one. In this, in this example, and also in these two, you see a pair of ribbons down the front. Um, these are called that literally children and grandchildren ribbon, and they're meant to forecast a fertile and song dominant marriage. And that tie is actually a relic of a Ming Dynasty garment called Pifeng, which started off as a semi formal woman's coat, very long, very loose fitting, with large sleeves, and a central front opening the pair of ties is showing this mean in these Ming Dynasty uh, woodcuts. So Xie Feng Zhuren, in his, the guy I've, I've cited here, in his blog post about the evolution of the people into these, uh, trace that the development of the people into the Qing Dynasty coat, which can be ornamented with eight rondelles and sending water or rank badges on entering squares, which then evolved into the short jacket that we know and love as part of the Qing world today. To further illustrate my point, here are three photos of three generations of women from the Yuan family. Lady on the left is this photo was taken in the 1910s. The lady in question is Yuan's fifth wife, Madame Yang. Uh, the middle one is Madame Yang's daughter in law, Chen Wei, photo taken during the 30s. Both of these ladies are dressed for some formal occasion. And correspondingly addressing the Qinghua. The lady on the 
Right, it's Chen Wei's daughter-in-law. It's her daughter-in-law. This lady is her daughter-in-law, Wang Jiarong, and this was taken on a wedding day in 1941. And even in black and white, you can see that you know this fashion has changed. Length of you know the ornamentation style has changed. The hairstyle has changed. The sleeve length has changed, and so on and so forth. Um, even within 30 years. But what remained constant is the color of the top, the style of ornamentation. All of them have the eight rondelle format. Hmm. Excuse me. The skirt of the Qinghua has also evolved. So the Qing, so the most common skirt in the Qing dynasty was a Mamian skirt, which consists of two identical sections. So this will go front, this will go the back, with pleats. And this is very, very fine knife pleats. And you when you wear it, you wrap it around you. So one of this is in the front and the other one is in the back. This is called a mamian, a horse face. As time went on, and, and this is a gold example, you can see where it overlaps. As time went on, this this sort of this is a gold mamian skirt, this is a pleated mamian. As time went on, it became a tube skirt with pleated sections on either side. So you just slip it on. And the mamian is now uh, is not detached anymore, like this one or this one. It's completely sewn shut. Uh, it's now a, a zone for, for decoration at front and the back, or as in these examples, it's a separate it's a separate apron. It's like an apron thing. So here we have um, again, obviously from the forties and fifties. So this is a this is a Chihuahua made in the fifties. To and this is some Taobao vendor pictures I found pretty recent. Tastes have changed as well, and the color of the outfits has changed. Um, the black top and red skirt that was good for brides in the 50s is now reserved for moms and grandmas of bride and groom and also elderly female guests, but not the bride herself. Um, nowadays, brides wear red and red. Um, the metalwork embroidery has gotten a lot more elaborate, it's, you know, covering more and more of the outfit. And the jacket itself is completely Western tailoring. It's got darts, it's got setting sleeves, um, whereas older examples have no darts. And you can see here the sleeve, it's set, it's cut in one with a garment. This, I hope, is pretty self-explanatory, but, you know, this is what historical clothing is. I'm old. Let's have a look at the chat. Okay. Um, this is the equivalent of our, so ancient clothing, this is a literal translation of drawn literally ancient clothing costume. It's equivalent to our period drama or costume drama. And the four screen caps from left and right are, this is a TV adaptation of a modern time travel novel called Leaving a Tale of Love. This is a fant fantasy historical TV series called Nirvana and Fire, which is very similar in some ways to Game of Thrones, uh, also adopted from a novel, adapted from a novel. This is a historical TV series about Song Tzu, which, who is a Northern Song judge, physician, and anthropologist, and also the author of the world's first book on forensic science called The Collected Cases of Injustice Rectified. And this is a lovely adaptation, 1987 adaptation of the 18th century uh, novel, Dream of the Red Chamber. So none of these are historically accurate. And they're not expected to be historically accurate either. Um, Chinese historical TV series, like a lot of them now will claim to have to be historically accurate, they're not. And they are not appropriate sources for culture and research. Please do not take a picture you saw in some pretty TV series, some pretty C drama, and ask people, is this period? 
It is not. You've taken it from a historical TV series. It is not, period. Don't ask these questions. Yes, yeah, some Anglophone examples of Gu Zhuangzi. And it's about the same caliber as previously. Spanish princess, Vikings, the Borgias, and Rome. But, but these are uh, like when, when you when you bring a picture from you know a chi a, a C drama and ask me or someone else, oh, is this period? You are doing the equivalent of taking a picture from the Vikings and asking, oh, is this period for Viking? It's not. It's not. So let's go. Having said this, having try to delineate as best as I can the difference between historical Chinese, you know, the difference between historical, traditional, and ethnic clothing, I guess. Let's have a look at some examples of historical Chinese clothing as depicted in historical art and see if they fit with New Hampshire's definition of it. So, so let's just have a re revisit this, these definitions. And go. Is this handful? We've got big wide sweeps. We've got. Is it. Are things wrapping towards the right? Mm, I don't know. Can't tell. Are there any fastenings other than ties? We don't know. We can't see any. Are there big white sleeves? No, no, this is all very narrow sleeves. Is a lap hole wrapping towards the right? We can't tell. Are there any fastenings other than ties? Well, the ladies have the ties here, but you can't see it, say, for this robe. We can't tell. Would everything be secured by ties? Probably not. Are these tampons? You know, we, do we have big white sleeves here? No, we don't. They're very slim. And by the way, this is what Tang Dynasty Han Fu is. But is a lap or wrapping, is, is, are things being wrapped towards the right? We can't tell. This lady here has a central front opening to a jacket. This one, we can't tell. Is everything secured by ties? There's a tie here and there's a tie here, but would everything be secured by ties? Probably not. Big wide sleeves? No. Very slim. Lap or wrapping towards the right? Mm, maybe. Can't tell. Are there any fastenings and ties? These figurines have their clothes literally stitched on or glued onto them, so no, there is no tie. I don't know what's going on at, on the left. It does not conform with the Town Dynasty pictures that we've just seen. These are all Town Dynasty stuff from you know this one is even from later on in the town you see than these three examples this picture on the right is a screenshot from the 2006 film curse of the golden flower and they've decided to use a film screen cap as an example of pamphlet Jesus Christ, guys. In terms of the broader contemporary Chinese culture and the linguistic context, the term hanfu came to public awareness for the first time in this column on page 25 of Singapore's Yenke Zopo, dated the 29th November 2003. And I, like, I couldn't actually get a clearer picture than this from the from the Singapore, from the from the newspaper archive, but to summarize this newspaper column, the gentleman the pic in the picture is called Wang Letian, and he's an electrician from Chengzhou, Henan Province, Central China. He discovered Hava, literally translates to Han Net, and he's in in April this year, i.e., two thousand three, and was encouraged by his internet friend to put words to action, i.e., where Hanfu out and about. The handful workshop that made his clothes, he also got to know from Hanwa, literally handnet, Han, handnet. And these two bits come from a publication literally called Handful Big Events, of which I have a copy. 
So this bit says on the 22nd of November 2003, Wang Letian, username Zhang Zhiling Yun, walked the streets of Zhengzhou in traditional Han clothing. This bit says, oh, no, sorry, this bit. This is the first time traditional Han clothing has appeared on the street since when it went extinct more than 300 years ago by decree of the Shenzhi Emperor to wear men, men, menstrual clothing. This set of garments was made by Achu of Taiwei Workshop. After the style of clothing that appeared in the TV series, The Great Prince of Han. So this indicates that this is a book or TV series. In this case, it's a TV series. And here are the poster of the, of the Prince of Han Dynasty. Here's a screen cap of the costume from the Prince of Han Dynasty. I hope from your limited exposure to Western Han clothing, as exemplified by Malandu one, that this is clearly something modern and made up. Now you can tell it's something modern and made up. So, like, here are some, and this by the way says, history, fantasy, TV series, 41 episodes. Now here are some errors of facts. The Shenzhi Emperor, was the second emperor of the Qing dynasty. It ruled between 1643 CE and 1631 CE. So he's actually Kangxi's, Kangxi's father. He did issue an edict ordering adult Han men to shave most of their head and style the remainder of the pigtail as menstrual men. So if you guys have been exposed to um, images of men from later on in the Qing dynasty, photos of them, you, you know, the the cue that they're wearing, yeah, that's what he wants them to do. Han women, that's what he wanted the Han men to do to their, to their hair, to make it, to shave off half of the hair and style the remainder into a plate. Han women's clothing and hairstyles, however, were exempt from this order. They were not asked to change their, they were not compelled to change anything about their appearance. And in fact, throughout the Qing dynasty, there was always at least one attempt by the emperor or by the authorities to ban foot binding. As such, the argument of, oh, traditional hand clothing went extinct to roughly 300 years ago does not make much sense at all, unless you don't consider Han women people. Right? Only men were required to change their clothes, the women weren't. Yet you say it is extinct. You say the hand clothing is extinct. But you are only looking at the men, so you're not looking at the women. Are women in the considerations, not people? Hand women continue to dress as they did, as they, as they were at the time, and as time went on, their clothing changed just as they would in any other part of the world. Second thing is, See this TV series? Highly fictionalized. It's also a TV series. We've talked about how you don't use TV series as research. The costuming is probably the equivalent of something like the Tudors, in other words, subpar and bearing very little resemblance to the historical costumes they purport to represent. In actual history, this emperor reigned between, reigned about here, so in this case, not only did a copy of a costume from a highly fictionalized TV series set here got promoted to the to be the traditional clothing of the Han people, you know, named after the Han dynasty for sure, yeah, but also incredibly diverse in and of ourselves, but it was all selected. Some uh, a fictionalized take on clothing from this period was selected as a response to edicts issued by the 17th century Shenzhi Emperor, ignoring everything that has occurred between this point and this point. Right. You can't 
you cannot truncate the Manchurian Qing dynasty, this dynasty, from any discussion of Chinese history, Chinese clothing, the history of Chinese clothing, and expect it to be legitimate and informative. Here is are things from here is Hamong, and this literally asks people: Is the Yuan Dynasty and the Qing Dynasty are they do they count as Chinese? Are they part of Chinese history? Well, of, of course they are. Um, you can't lop things off because oh my God, foreigners ruling us, non Han people ruling us, without a, that discussion being inter, inter, intellectually dishonest. It's like saying historical costumes from England after 166 common era doesn't count as English because William the Conqueror and his Normans turned up. You can't say that Coptic, Coptic Egyptian tunics aren't Egyptian enough because they were produced after the Roman conquest of Egypt. Of course they're not Egyptian. They're, they're not Egyptian enough because they were produced after the Romans came. Do you, do you understand how ridiculous and absurd these arguments are? Like, like this is? Yeah, now you do. There's also the issue of um, ethnicity in the PRC. So officially there are 56 ethnic groups. At present, 92% of the population is Han. And the most commonly spoken language in the People's Republic of China is Mandarin, and Han culture is very, very dominant as a culture, but also as a cultural influence. In this particular context, the 55 remaining ethnic minorities, that is the other 8% of the PRC population, have their ethnic clothing as a means of representing themselves as being different to the default Han. You know, one argument posed by the Hamong, you know, these people. One argument for the invention of Han was because hell, everyone else have an ethnic costume and they don't. Guys, this is the same logic as straight people wanting straight pride flags or white people wanting white representation and white pride parades. Like, the Han ethnicity is so overwhelmingly in majority in the PRC and also in the diaspora population, that it needs no special reminder, no special identifier, either sartorial or cultural, what have you. Um, another argument, again, for the invention of Hanfu is because the Qipa or the Chongsun or the Tangsu are too Manchurian. You see, because, the Manch because you know, we came after the Qing dynasty, it's too Manchuria, we can't have it. You know what that's called? That's history revisionism. We don't like that. Nobody likes that. Anyway, again, you just can't cut out. You can't lock this, up, this part off from a discussion of this Chinese history. And, it's, and especially you can't lock off a discussion about historical Chinese clothing, pop this one off from a discussion of historical Chinese clothing and expect it to be legitimate and informative. Um, think about the talk I just had all the way back here, the discussion I had about this, right? If I took away the Qing dynasty aspect of it, if I jumped straight from the Ming dynasty, to the modern day, it wouldn't make much sense. It wouldn't make much sense at all. You can't, you can't chop and paste, cut and paste history because you don't like a certain ethnic group. That's not how any of this work. Handful, let me put it undiplomatically, is doing this and it's bullshit. Anyways, here's a mapping the argument. It's 3,000 plus years of historical costume, clothing, and it also equates traditional costume and fashion history and costume history is like, I'm not a joke to you. Like, did you just ignore the fact that clothing, as I just demonstrated with the Qinghua, the evolution of the Qinghua throughout time, clothes change. Nothing stays the same for 50 years, let alone 100, let alone three and a half millennia. 
you know, yeah, the Qing Dynasty had the change of order, change of dress and hairstyle edicts. Han women were exempt. Some people say Qing Dynasty stuff, beyond a set point doesn't count. Yeah, like, fifth, like just under 50% of your population didn't have to change anything. And yet you just deny that hand clothing ceased to exist after the middle of the 17th century. Are you saying that half your people don't count because they're not people? Hmm? Hmm? Is that what I hear from you a lot, misogyny? Hanfu also has in recent years become a casual term. And this Hanfu, the traditional, the so the traditional uh, ethnic clothing of Han people, with the cutoff of 1644 that completely disrupts the fact that ethnic, historical, and traditional clothing are not also interchangeable, as previously mentioned, and that you just can't do history revision by cutting and pasting history. There's handful the modern history bounding streetwear. So we, for those of you who are familiar, think Lolita fashion, which is all about that aesthetics. And there's handful the term for historical costuming at various levels of accuracy, with often a strong cultural and ethnic supremacy slant. The issue of the issue there is that there are people in the handful movement who didn't still do care about historical accuracy and doing research of what they're wearing. And I'm like, can't you guys just do your own thing? Why must you cling to this term that literally started because of a desire to be even more represented than you already are? Like, can we just step away from this term and use the right term, which in my opinion would be historical Chinese clothing? I would also like to make it clear that Hanfu is not really, despite my very, my passion for this, for the topic, Hanfu is not, not everyone who wears Hanfu is a Han supremacist. Remember, like, remember, if you don't remember anything else from my talk, remember this, not everyone who wears Hanfu is a Han supremacist. The term has now been around for about 20 years, you know, it started in 2003. And Hanfu is a huge industry now in uh, China. Um, many people who wear it are not aware of where the term comes from and how loaded it is. And they generally believe that reviving traditional arts and culture when tradition is often much closer to you in terms of the timeline than you think. My problem isn't really with the people who wear them. My problem is with Hanfu, the object or the category of object itself. And as I said here, this, um, because Hanfu, the term came into public consciousness a while before, you know, historical costuming became something like a hobby, a viable hobby in mainland China. People would often use, say, Hanfu, but they kind of mean historical costuming. Um, some handful in my own research has benefited from the works of people who at a point in the past has been in the handful community. Some of the best recreations of the Malandu one stuff was done by someone who used to be in the handful community, handful movement. Um, also the big, because it's such a big market, the demand for accessories, footwear, clothing, fabrics, and also China's, mainland China's relatively cheap labor costs, and the fact it's also a global textile production powerhouse means that, you know, reproduction footwear, reproduction fabrics, and so on can be had at a lower price than most Western ring actors can, you know, would expect to pay for that stuff. Well, it's, it's it's not as clear as much as I want it to be black and white clear cut. It's not. So keep that in mind. Um, here's a handful video. I'm going to post it in the chat. I'm going to post that in the chat. And here's recommended reading. I'm also going to post that in the chat. And yeah, thank you for coming to my talk. Yeah, what seriously, guys, watch this. <laughs> um.
and this is Kevin Carrico, The Great Hand Race. Please read this. It's a good book. Um, he, Kevin explained things much more eloquently than I can. All right. Q&A time. I'm going to stop sharing the screen and, and stop the recording.